My name is uh, Emanuele Barbato. I'm uh, chairing this session together with my colleagues, um, Sandeep Karra from UK. And we are excited to uh, have this session together. Let's, uh, let's just share the content of this session uh, in a minute. These are my conflict of interest. Why we are here? I think we need to agree on this first uh, objective. We are here because we would like to understand more and how unraveling the mechanism of stent failure is key to an optimal treatment of the problem. We are here to receive tips and tricks for the effective treatment of stent failure and to learn how intravascular imaging guided PCI planning and optimization can help to prevent stent failure. I think it's always interesting to prevent rather than to treat. I think you agree on this. We have an excellent uh, team. That's the program of today. Myself and Sandeep, we already introduced, but we also have there in the panel, Paolo Canova, Nieves Gonzalo, Jan Kanowski, and Lawrence Rubber. The content in two words is uh, made of uh, two expert interviews, really, focused on the topic of interest. We prepared two cases, one case example of stent failure and one case, one recorded case of best practice aiming at preventing stent failure. At least that's what we, we believe. But there is an important ingredient in the content of this session that I would like uh, Sandeep to emphasize, the importance of the interaction. Sandeep. Thank you, thank you, Emmanuel. So I think the real educational value of this type of session will come from the discussion that we have around the two excellent cases we have prepared. We've got two ways that we can bring discussion to the forum here. So the first, we've got our chat master, who's Dr. Rohit Umra Singh, who's got his iPad ready. So if you want to ask any questions through the app, he will see them live, and he will answer either on the app or pass them to the panel so that we can discuss some of these points um, in real time. But also in the central aisle, there's two microphones, so in between... Um, little sections. Um, if you want to come up and ask a question, there's two microphones in the aisle and you can ask questions there. And myself or Manuel will, um, will pause at relevant points to invite questions. Thank you very much. So I think we are ready to go. I think we attracted enough the attention of the colleagues here. And the first case is for Nieves, who's showing what we would not like to see still, but it can happen. Let's see how Nieves managed. Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, session. I'm going to present you a case uh, of a 71-year-old male, you can see, that uh, presented initially with an inferior STEMI. You can see his uh, right coronary artery occluded. And uh, at the time, the operators uh, decided to treat this uh, with thrombus aspiration. You can see there the aspiration. And after that, they proceeded. Um, there was a primary PCI, so dart stent implantation. You can see the stand, 275 by 28 millimeters. And I think you can already appreciate that something is not going that well. After implantation, you can see a waste in the balloon that is not opening properly. And clearly, you can see uh, that there is uh, a, de a significant degree of under expansion at this level. So this was, uh, at, the, at the time, the operators tried to correct this with high pressure uh, post dilation with a non-compliant balloon, uh, 3.0. This is um, the post dilation, and this is the final result. So this is what they achieved. They were really not able to correct the underexpansion, but well, by angiography, it looks underexpanded, but they accepted the result, and this was the final uh, angiogram from this patient. So um, some still images here highlighting the final result and um, the problem. Um, the current presentation is that this patient came back with a stent thrombosis stent thrombosis of the right coronary arteries and stent thrombosis of this under-expanded stent. And this is um, when I knew the patient for the first time. You can see there that I'm trying to open this uh, lesion with a 3 balloon and I'm having already the same problem. This uh, balloon does not open. This is uh, the vessel after uh, opening it with a balloon. And you can see that actually we have this problem. And at this point, I think it's very relevant to understand what is going on. Of course, we know by angiography that there is under expansion, but it's very important to do imaging in these situations to try to understand what was the real problem. You can see here 
this is the problem. The stent is extremely underexpanded. There is also some degree of neointima in the in the distal part. So if we go to the uh, most relevant still images, you will clearly see that distally there is some degree of uh, neointimal hyperplasia. But the problem is this 24% uh, underexpansion. And I think it's um, interesting because probably if the operators at the first time would have seen these kind of images, uh, they wouldn't have let the patient go. So even if the imaging by angiography was acceptable, I think this is not acceptable when you have a look um, at the OCT images. And you can see clearly that the cause of this is significant calcification. Um, so this, in this case, we treated it with, uh, with uh, shockwave, with um, IVL, um, to, uh, to treat this under expansion. And you can see that after the application of 80 pulses, we were able to expand the stent. So the, the balloon looks open, but of course, it's very relevant in these cases to make sure that we have um, achieved a good result. <laughs> And we have not let areas of uh, focal under expansion that can cause problems again. And I think this OCT pullback shows how uh, the stent looks now properly expanded. These are the images corresponding to the areas where we had previously the severe under expansion. And you can see now that the stent area has increased significantly after uh, the treatment with IVL. And in this case, we decided to finish this uh, with a coated balloon. And this was uh, the final result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nieves. Please join us here in the panel. And also, thanks for sharing these cases. Not, sometimes these cases are its like the dust that are, is put under the carpet. And the fact of sharing this kind of situation can only be enriching for all of us. To kick off the discussion now, let me just inquire here in the room, uh, how many of you systematically, when you are confronted with a case of stent failure, we also had one. All of us had one. I'm not, I'm sure everyone had one. And I would be really interested in knowing how would you manage this case and whether you would, imaging, intravascular imaging is the first thing you would think at to understand the mechanism. Now, truly, honestly, raise your hand when you have a stent failure and you would consider imaging as a first step. Raise your hand. That's quite encouraging. Actually, 50% of the colleagues in the room, irrespective of the fact whether they think that the cause of stent failure might be obvious or not, they would still consider to do intravascular imaging. Let me hear the opinion here in the panel. Let me start by Paul over there. Do you think it is always worth to do imaging and why? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Manuele. I think this is a, a really a smart question, a key question. In a case like this one, I think it's quite clear and obvious that uh, the, stand, the cause of the stent failure is secondary to the stent uh, under expansion. But I think that it's not uh, as uh, clear and as obvious. The amount of calcium at this level is not as obvious. What is the minimal stent area? What is the diameter of the vessel in that point? So I think that it's a must in a case like this one, and I totally agree with uh, Nives or of what Nives did uh, to perform an imaging before taking this uh, lesion and to decide what is the best device to treat this stent under expansion. Let me ask uh, Jan. I on purpose skip uh, Lawrence because to Lawrence will ask a much broader question in a minute. Uh, I'd like to hear in your practice, Jan, what is your attitude when you, and what is the attitude of your colleagues, not just yours? If you are here, I suspect you are a believer of imaging. But in general, is there resistance in the group in doing in the middle of the night intravascular imaging before opening up the balloon, which would be the first reflex you would have and try to fix it with another stand, for example, or drug loading balloon or whatever? I have to say that uh, <coughs> for a couple of years now we have some standards uh, in our cat lab and uh, on top of the indication for an intravascular imaging is stand failure. So I believe also me and all my colleagues, the first thing they think about if they see a stand failure to try to you know allow either IVUS or OCT uh, images if it's possible. So uh, usually the OCT uh, indication in the stand failure is the first one we do and I believe it's the same for the other colleagues in my cat lab. To Nieves, with hindsight, now you have seen this patient post-doc. Is there something you would have done differently in the first place? Yeah, I think this is a good example of um, uh, the most frequent uh, situation that can lead to a stand under expansion. Or one of the most frequent is this is primary PCI in the middle of the night. 
probably uh, you do this procedure with a different mindset uh, that if you do it in the morning, uh, probably the evaluation of calcium is not that clear. You don't want to uh, put a lot of balloons there because of the risk of neuroflow. So it's like the perfect storm for extended under expansion, primary PCI. So um, I think uh, what is interesting in this case is that seeing it retrospectively, if the operators could have decided to do imaging in the first procedure, once they obtain this uh, result, uh, probably they would have tried to do something else. I mean, they, in the end, they accepted an angiographic result that was bad, but was not not too bad. But if they would have seen this uh, OCT image with this extent uh, under expansion, this extreme under expansion, they would I think they would have tried to correct it somehow. So this is my my take uh, uh, my my main message from uh, from this case. Sandeep, I see a lot of activity in the chat. Do you want to highlight? the most important point there for us? So I, th I think one of the points has just been brought about that we, we have legacy cases of underexpanded stents due to calcium. And in the last five years, we have a technology that is allowing us to treat these legacy cases, which Nevis very successfully used, which was IVL. But there is an important question that if you don't have IVL available, what other options do you have? We saw with the index case, high pressure post dilatation was performed with little effect. And there's a specific question about the use of OPN balloons here. Well, I, I'll share you my, my thought. I'll share you my thought. What I wouldn't do, what I would try not to do, is stand ablation. That's something I would strongly discourage, if possible. And high pressure balloon is certainly the only option left. I don't know any other option. If you don't have IVL, you don't want to do stand ablation, then high pressure balloon is the way to go. Is there any different opinion about this or other? Comments they about this. There's certainly an option in uh, institutions where it is available. Patient where it is available. Also, yeah. um, that is not maybe Lawrence? Maybe no, I agree. And uh, to make such a procedure safe, I think the information obtained by the imaging uh, uh, is important too, because you will be provided with the reference EEM to EEM measurement, which gives you a flavor of what the maximal balloon size that you may uh, inflate up to 40 atmospheres uh, can go, not to risk a uh, vessel perforation. And actually, this is nicely introdu introducing um, the interview of Lawrence, uh, if you take the lectern uh, to him. Uh, of course, you cannot just escape it like this. To, from you, we would like to know whether intravascular imaging has a role, uh, not just to understand the mechanism, to guide treatment, and possibly what we want to learn from you, Lawrence, is how can we prevent these situations for the future? Yes, thank you, Emanuele. So basically, uh we have to discuss the common causes of failure with respect to, to uh, thrombotic occlusion, stent thrombosis and restenosis. And uh, here just some examples of the mo most frequent causes underlying stent thrombosis. Actually, the gold standard for the assessment of stent thrombosis uh, clearly is uh, uh, OCT because uh, most time, in most times the, the problem is related to the stent and uh, the lumen. So what you see here is a classical example of uh, uh, persistent uncoverage. The reason is obvious there was too much polymer and drug load because uh, multiple uh, uh, layers of stent have been placed which uh, does not allow for uh, proper healing and this under certain condition of course can cause thrombosis. Um, one effect to uh, avoid uh, uh, lack of uh, neointimal coverage is to make the stent really uh, going well into the vessel wall and that's of course an effect uh, uh, achieved by post dilatation. So another um, uh, frequent cause of uh, stent thrombosis is clearly acute uh, malaposition. This is uh, an example of a drastic uh, malaposition which can occur. I mean, the human eye is not perfect and sometimes there is uh, surprising, you will find surprisingly underexpanded or malaposed uh, stents that uh, can early or also late result in thrombosis. Now, this is an example uh, that shows a very late stent thrombosis, which is a little bit more uh, tricky to interpret because what you see here is, and you would agree that this is clearly thrombus, and then we have the stent area here, but there is a surprising contour here, and if you measure the area there, you get up to 20 
square millimeters. So the question now is what is this? And it's clear the second contour was where the blood flew before the thrombosis. So inclusion, in conclusion, this here is all thrombus and the stent was grossly malaposed, but not due to persist, not due to uh, acute malaposition, but rather due to positive vessel remodeling as a response uh, to the polymer or uh, the drug, and the vessel grew and left behind the stent struts. This is a common uh, reason for very late stent thrombosis. And then one of uh, the um, uh, other important reason is uh, geographical miss. So you leave black burden behind at the stent edge in conjunction with dissection. This is really also a, a something that should be avoided. And finally, and that's uh, um, an issue that cannot be addressed uh, clearly by the PCI per se, that's uh, uh, the neoatherosclerotic tissue inside the stent. Here is a ruptured, an example of a ruptured neoatheroma that leads to thrombosis. Now, with respect to restenosis, we have seen uh, the case of uh, Nieves with uh, grossly underexpanded stent. So what you usually have to do is to draw a line uh, along the stent struts and then compare it with your reference uh, uh, zone and you then calculate the stent expansion and uh, here uh, the stent expansion is probably about 40 percent which is insufficient another reason um, is uh, geographical mist that's a frequent reason for restenosis that you don't place the stent from healthy to healthy but rather land it in a zone where there is residual plaque burden and that's a, a, an acknowledged and a consistent trigger of restenosis stent fracture that can be seen um, ad hoc uh, w using uh, the 3D animation of uh, with with the OCT uh, software is a uh, not so much frequent uh, reason of restenosis and finally if we go to bifurcations or to osteal stent placement there is uh, the issue of uh, too much protrusion of the side branch stand into the main vessel, which then uh, leads to a formation of a neointimal bridge, as shown here, which then can result in a restenosis as well. So, in summary, in summary, with imaging, we are able to detect about 90% of the underlying reasons. Uh, we call that a root cause analysis. And based on that, you take uh, tailored measures. And uh, only in the residual 10%, you will not probably not be able to understand the reason. Now, this has a direct, a direct uh, impact on the treatment strategy that you are using. There is a nice paper on this um, in Euro Intervention. But basically, if you have a malapost stent as cause of the failure, it makes no sense to implant the second stent because you potentially aggravate the problem. The only, the only reason would be res much residual thrombus burden that you have to cover with the stent, but if you have a geographical miss situation or a dissection or a neoatherosclerosis as reason for the underlying problem, then an additional uh, stent placement makes uh, much more sense. Now, the key question is, of course, how can we prevent all these disasters? And we can prevent it by imaging-guided PCI. This is just a summary evidence we have from all the randomized IBUS versus angio trials. And as you can see, you can achieve a 50, 60 percent mace reduction, including cardiovascular death and TLR. So this would be the way to uh, ultimately avoid uh, such complications. But if you have the complication, we really need to understand what is the cause to treat the patient in a uh, the lesion and the patient in a, a tailored uh, fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for this nice overview and for convincingly um, telling us that indeed, uh, especially in some settings, if we are guiding our PCR with intravascular imaging, we might prevent this kind of a, a very uh, untoward situation. And to Paolo, we asked us to explain us practically how to do it. And that's what Paolo prepare, uh, did for us. He prepared a beautiful case that he recorded back in Bergamo. Paolo, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Manuele. Thank you all for uh, uh, the opportunity to record uh, the case in, uh, in my center. I have uh, nothing to add, so I can uh, move directly to start the movie. And let's see. Thank you, Emanuele. 
Uh, welcome uh, everybody, I'm Dr. Uh, Paolo Canova from uh, Papa Giovanni Hospital uh, in Bergamo and it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and to share this case of an OCT guided stenting of calcific LID disease. Today working with me, there is my friend and colleague uh, uh, Dr. Luigi Fiocca. We have our two nurses, uh, Michele on the table with us uh, and uh, Marzia. And uh, last but not least, our radiology technician, uh, Ilaria. Uh, before the kickoff of the case, I asked to Luigi to present uh, the uh, clinical history of the patient. So Luigi. So good morning, everybody. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, we have on the table a male, 63 year old. You can see the cardiovascular risk factors and the clinical history. His uh, uh, cardiological history begins in November 27 uh, with an uh, inferior MI treated with a bare metal stent uh, in the middle distal RCA. Recently, he had a new onset of angina. He performed a myocardial spect that uh, uh, showed us uh, anterior and uh, inferior ischemia. Uh, so ejection fraction of the left ventricle was preserved. And then let's go to the angio. The angio shows a totally occluded uh, RCA. The occlusion is at the level of uh, the stent. Then uh, we go on, uh, uh, we move to the uh, um, left coronary. The left coronary is our uh, uh, um, topic today, is our um, uh, uh, the lesion that we have to, to treat today. As we can see, it's uh, uh, proximal to mid uh, uh, LAD between two uh, huge uh, diagonal branch. Uh, we will study it uh, with uh, OCT, with Ultraon software, and uh, uh, we will see how OCT guiding can help us uh, in uh, deciding uh, how to treat calcium, where is the landing zone, and so on. Perfect. So here we are. As uh, Luigi said, we have a very calcific lesion in the middle part of LAD. We have already uh, cannulated. We, ha we are from uh, radial, a uh, six in seven uh, ra radial axis uh, with uh, an uh, EBU 3.75 uh, seven French uh, guiding catheter. And we have uh, already advanced a BMW wire in the distal part of the coronary artery. We acquired some uh, basal angel. If you want Ilaria to show the basal angel of today, here uh, uh, we, we avoided to inject the right, as uh, Luigi said, it's totally occluded. And this is the angel, the cranial view of today. Again, a calcific lesion. We can appreciate the calcium also by angel in the middle part of LID. This is the cranial, and we have also the caudal view to show. And I think. Uh, we can start uh, from an angel point of view, these uh, angel I think are uh, enough. So we can start and we can advance directly the OCT catheter. It's a dragonfly and uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will see with OCT the distribution of this uh, uh, calcium <coughs> and uh, we will guide our procedure. I will do. Perfect. Okay. We have uh, our OCT pullback, and now we go to comment uh, what uh, we can see. As uh, Luigi said uh, at the beginning, we generally follow the MLD max algorithm. MLD for uh, the first part of the procedure and max, we will see later after the stent implanta implantation. MLD is an acronym for M, morphology, L, length and D, diameter of the vessel and of the devices you decided to use to prepare your plaque. We generally start from uh, L and from uh, D, so length and diameter. So we have to select uh, where we want to land uh, with uh, our stent. And we were discussing, I and Luigi, if uh, uh, to land uh, before the second uh, septal, where uh, you can see that the software Ultreon can automatically detect the EEL, which is underlined in this longitudinal view with the white line, which it means that uh, the software is uh, uh, able to recognize in an EEL suitable for measurement. But uh, uh, you can see that also uh, beyond the uh, second septal, we can have uh, an EEL 
measurement and of course we decided to land this tal. Why? Because uh, at the level of the septal you can see that there is a lumen of the coronary artery uh, of uh, uh, around three millimeter uh, of square and of course we don't want uh, to have uh, a, a, a lesion in that point uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, the stent. So we decided to land uh, distal, in the distal uh, uh, part uh, uh, beyond uh, the septal, and at this level we have an uh, EEL uh, of three. So it means that our stents will be a 3.0 for the distal uh, part. Let's move to the proximal, and to the proximal uh, part, we wanted to land uh, here just uh, uh, before the uh, first diagonal. And again, you can see how the software can automatically detect uh, the EEL. And uh, at this level, for example, there is a, a good uh, uh, lumen and there is a good e a EEL suitable for the measurement. And we have a vessel of uh, five uh, millimeter of uh, diameter. As you can understand, we generally follow an EEL protocol. So we size our stents and our balloon based on EEL and not uh, uh, based on the lumen, of course, when uh, it's uh, possible. So we have decided where to land proximal, we have decided where to land uh, distal, and automatically we have the length of the, le of the lesion. You can see here there is a lesion around 30, 30, uh, three, uh, three, uh, 39, around 30 millimeter. So we have uh, two of the uh, information that we wanted from OCT, the length and the diameter of stents. Let's move to the morphology. If we uh, go to see the morphology of the lesion at uh, this level, you can see, as we expected, that there are lots of uh, uh, calcification. And again, the software Ultran automatically detect uh, with the orange bar where the calcification are more than 180 degrees, because this, this is the threshold that we chosen uh, for the setup uh, of, uh, of the case and that uh, we generally uh, use. So when you can see the orange in the longitudinal view, it means that uh, you have calcification more than 180 degrees. And here again, the, mm, the machine automatically detects the angle of the calcification frame by frame. And not, it's not, uh, not all, but you can have also the information about the thickness of calcium. And here you can see how we have uh, not only uh, distribution around 30, 60 degree, but also uh, thickness of uh, more than 0 0.5, which we know it's uh, the critical point uh, for this core that we can uh, use. If we check uh, in uh, all the interest uh, part of the vessel that we want to treat, uh, again, you can see uh, the calcification, it's not orange in the longitudinal view here, but it doesn't mean that you don't have calcium because you can see in the single cross section that there is the, uh, the orange part, which, which it means that you have calcification, again, thick, calcifica thick calcification and with an angle of 70 uh, degrees. So with uh, all this amount of calcium here, we have the most critical part of the vessel. And if we move, to the sizing, we have a lumen of around 1.39, 1.42. So with this uh, thick calcium, Luigi, and uh, superficial and also deep calcification. Probably with this distribution of calcium, uh, uh, also a rotablation, a rotablation can be uh, a good strategy to start uh, uh, to test uh, how this calcium respond. Uh, to this ablation, and then uh, we can uh, see what else uh, to add. Yes, I totally agree. So I think that uh, we can start with uh, an ablative technique for this calcification, and uh, uh, we have chosen uh, the rotational laterectomy. I think we can go, uh, Luigi, if we check to the lumen here, we can go with a uh, burr or 1.5, 1.75. We can yeah. choose 1.75. Yeah. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we will see if uh, to do something more, if cutting, scoring, uh, yes, non-compliant balloon see. or we shock wave, yeah, yeah. if it's not uh, enough. Enough, yes. Perfect. So we have uh, decided the strategy based on uh, uh, what we have seen uh, in uh, OCT. 
and using this MLD Max protocol, we have all the information. We have the, the, um, the dimension of the stent and of the ballo of balloon to use in the distal, in the proximal, in the middle part. We have the length of uh, uh, the lesion, and of course, we have all the information about the calcification. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. By the way, excellent illustration on how to really use imaging uh, to step-by-step step, um, understanding the morphology, the length, uh, the diameter of the vessel. The first thing I was uh, really uh, impressed of was the mismatch between angiogram, the information we collected on the angiogram, and the information we have collected on intravascular imaging, on OCT. To be completely honest with you, I wouldn't have anticipated so much calcium, and certainly I couldn't have even guessed that there was, at segments, circumferential calcification. That is the most important, the most important thing. Now the point is, do we have to use to avoid this situation intravascular imaging in all cases? Ideally, that would be a dream. Unfortunately, we are always confronted with budget constraint. Let me just inquire here in the room, what is the penetration of imaging in your practice? And I'll make it simple. Out of 100 percutaneous core intervention, let's use this one as a denominator. And I agree we can discuss, perhaps we should use core angiogram as a denominator, but let's put it simple. Out of 100 PCI, how many of you use currently imaging, OCT, IVUS, whatever, in 10% uh, of the cases? 10%, 10 out of 100 PCI, raise your hand. Okay. How many of you would use it in 20% of cases? Raise your hand. It's increasing, amazing. How many of you would use it in 50% of the cases? One out of two, PCIs. Okay, that's good. Um, and in a way, it is resembling what is the penetration uh, in different regions of, of the world. Uh, we know that in Japan, it's nearly 100%. In Europe, it must be around 10%. US, perhaps around 20%. So I, I would like to hear in the panel, um, first, about this mismatch between angiogram and OCT. Having seen this, what is your criteria? What are your criteria to decide, okay, this is the right patient, where I should use imaging? Let me start by Lawrence. Well, there are clear cut cases uh, where, of course, angiography and maybe the, uh, the behavior of the balloon tells you all, and you don't need necessarily imaging to decide on upgrading the lesion preparation. But there are, and this is such a case, uh, many in between cases where really the angiography that does not tell you the entire uh, truth and their uh, straightforward uh, uh, algorithm is really as you have to, uh, as you have seen to uh, estimate the circularity and it's very clear if more than three quadrants are concerned and if the calcium gets thicker than 0.5 millimeter and longer than five millimeter you risk you risk that you uh, end up with uh, expan under expansion is just increased it does not mean that with a, a routine angioguided procedure you don't achieve a good result, but it uh, does mean that uh, the average stent expansion is about 70% at the end, which is insufficient. Now, the next point is always the same. We see an image and we need to do something with this image. We need to react to the image. Otherwise, taking imaging just for the pleasure of having beautiful slides, it's not what we, uh, what we like to have in our practice. And I'd like to ask Jan, when you see this image, in, uh, in your practice? What is your reaction? What is your decision making? Okay, I see this, I need to do this, this and that. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, actually this kind of approach to the patient, it's a puzzle because you have uh, multiple points you have to put together. So you have your angiogram, you have your intravascular imaging, ideally you have your physiological assessment and uh, then uh, you decide uh, according to the, and I hope most of us already use this standard approach, you decide what's the best to do. So you go step by step as, as the standardization showed us. We are curious, how did you manage this case, Paolo? If we can go to the next step. Okay, let's move. And we are ready. Okay, we, I think we can start. You can hear the sound and the degrees of the... Okay, I think we passed the lesion. Okay, we can stop. 
here we are, and uh, this is uh, the second pullback after our plaque preparation yeah. with a rotational laterectomy above 1.75, and uh, after non-comprian balloon and uh, scoring balloon 3.5. Let's check uh, the result at uh, this level. You can see clearly that we fractured the calcium at, the des at this level in the distal part, and you can see uh, uh, the fracture of the calcium, which was thick. At uh, the proximal part where there was the narrowest uh, vessel, again, you can see some fracture of the plaque at uh, this level, but uh, we are not uh, sure about the fracture of the calcium at uh, this point. Of course, uh, there is uh, room to expand the stent in the uh, uh, alpha part of the vessel where there is no calcium, but uh, I think it's interesting to know the opinion of the panelists in studio to uh, know if they are satisfied about this result or uh, they uh, think uh, we have to do something more. Okay, let me ask the colleagues here. Are you satisfied with this result? And if not, if you think we need something more, raise your hand if you're happy with this result and you think we are ready to more move on with, I don't know, further balloon dilatation and maybe stent implantation. Raise your hand if you're happy. Raise your hand if you think we need to do more plaque modification with something different. Raise your hand. So majority would say we are happy with this. Minority would say we would do something more. Well, let me ask then to you, Nieves, if you think we should do something more, what would you do more? Yeah, so I think it's, um, this intermediate pullback, I don't, I don't think it's performed maybe by, and actually there is, um, um, this is the pullback that sometimes people say you can avoid this pullback after plaque uh, preparation. If you have obtained a good result, you can go with the balloon. If the balloon uh, expands, then you can go to sending and avoid this pullback. But I think actually this pullback is very interesting. And actually, I think uh, Paolo is showing in his, in his case an interesting finding. So he has uh, prepared properly the plaque in certain areas, but still he has a circular area of calcification in the proximal part that might need so more um, preparation. And this is very focal, this is very difficult to see with uh, the angiogram, and also sometimes even difficult to see to see these areas with the balloon. So I think I would still try to prepare this a little bit more. Uh, I think he used already How? scoring balloons, but I would, I would probably go for a cutting balloon it, at, this, uh, at this level. Paula, I'm curious. I, I agree with, with uh, Nieves. I wouldn't have done this intermediate OCT pullback. You know, it's prolonging in a way the, the procedure. Why did you do that? It's because we're preparing this case for this session no, or no, it's no. your practice? Because I think that really when I use the imaging uh, during the procedure, I want that imaging guide me from the beginning till the end. So uh, the purpose was uh, uh, to know what kind of device and plaque preparation to use uh, for the case. But at the end, I always check. It, it, it's not uh, time consuming. In uh, one minute, you have a pullback, you had uh, less than 50 millimeter, milliliter of contrast for a pullback, but uh, I want to, to see if the plaque preparation is enough or okay. not. Good. Let me, let me ask you what you, do, what you did next then. Okay. Now, we want to summarize at the end, we used the uh, um, rotational terectomy with a 1.75 burr, a cutting balloon 3.5, uh, a scoring balloon, excuse me, 3.5 millimeter, which a non compliant balloon, of course. We checked with OCT, but uh, we were not clearly satisfied yeah. about the result uh, in the, uh, the proximal part, part where uh, there were still, uh, again, some uh, calcification not well prepared. So we decided to go back to return with a bigger uh, cutting uh, scoring balloon uh, 4.0 and uh, we can uh, see the result now. In the distal part, we have already comment, we have the clear fracture that we have done before uh, uh, the plaque preparation with the 3.5. But more interesting is uh, if we move in the proximal part here, you can clearly see now fracture of the calcification here at this point, we can create some uh, cracks in the calcium. And so we are confident now that uh, the stent uh, will expand. Uh, will expand. Uh, we had uh, also the confirm uh, changing the view by Anjo that the balloon was uh, symmetrical uh, were symmetrical expanded, inflated. Yeah. And so uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, we want to know your opinion. So I give the ball in the studio in uh, Paris and to, I want to know and to, to hear the comment uh, of uh, of people about this plaque preparation. 
Thank you again. Well, let's hear again the comment here in the room. Uh, there was some, uh, some unhappiness. Some colleagues in the room uh, at inter Intermediate Step wanted to do some more plaque modification. Let's check again. Are you happy now with the plaque modification? Raise your hand. Is there still Orchard. someone who would do more? Is there still someone who would do more? OK, I think we convinced everyone. Good. Is there a question from the chat? Um, I think there are some important questions. So a couple of questions have come about the intermediate OCT step and and do we need to do any more preparation. I think from the first I, um, OCT run, we have the actual vessel dimensions. So there was a question, and I think it would be reasonable to, to actually just postulate one-to-one. -one. We know the vessel size. If you have not modified with a one-to-one -one, uh, pre-dilatation, then you have the option of using adjunctive techniques, so you're scoring your cutting balloons. And there was a question about IVL here, whether we should be using that as a first step rather than rotational atherectomy. So I think um, these are important things because we have several tools available to us nowadays to deliver this type of case. Well, let me ask the preference here in the panel. Anyone here would have done it differently? We saw how Paolo did in his practice, rotational atherectomy, cutting balloon thereafter. Anyone would have perhaps started with IVL right away, and why? I don't know if he... Yeah. I think that uh, Paolo did it uh, the same way I, how I would do it, and uh, actually we have a result before standing like standard results, so it's really nice. Would, I would agree, given the residual thickness of the calcium that you have seen in the intermediate uh, OCD pullback, which is really key to understand how, to which degree, rotoplation modified or ablated the plug. I mean, at the end, rotoplation is making the calcium thinner, and then the question is how thin you get the calcium by the rotoplation. And if, as you have shown, the calcium is still too thick, you need to do something in addition, and for cost effectiveness, uh, probably uh, the, the uh, scoring balloon is, is the best option at this point in time. Please. Did you think in such case uh, we can start? Can you speak closer? Did you think in such case you can start with balloon lystripsy uh, instead of rota? In such case, I, well, the I experience guess, of uh, balloon lystripsy in such. Case? I guess this was one of the bo the point we tried to address. Perhaps Nieves can can answer this. I think so. That's uh, another option in this case. One uh, maybe of the limitations is that it's a long lesion with change in uh, vessel size along the lesion. So you know that for IBL, ideally, you need to size the balloon one to one to the vessel. So probably, maybe in this case, if you need to treat a long segment with different uh, sizes of the vessel along the, the segment you need to treat, maybe for this uh, type of lesions, could be more efficient using uh, rotablation as they did in this case, plus scoring or cutting balloons. But it's an option, definitely. Yeah, for it sure. could have worked uh, well, for sure. So, Paolo, did you put a stand afterward, or did you do something yes, no, more? I, 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 one short comment. I yes, think uh, I totally agree on uh, what uh, Nive said and, and she underlined. But uh, I think that uh, I didn't do the best. I think uh, that if someone other here would have started with IVL, it could be a, 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 solu a, a great solution. The, the important thing is, uh, like in, in a football match, is the result. You have to win. So if, uh, if I went with a rotablation, another one with IVL, at the end you have the fracture to modify the calcium and to, to implant the stent. So let's move to the last part of the movie. Okay, we have just implanted the first uh, stent, a 3.023 sign sky point. And now we are implanting the second stent, which is again a sign sky point, uh, 3.533 for the proximal part. Okay, okay, go Luigi, inflate. Okay, 12, 14. 16, how much do you want? 16 is enough. Hmm? So here uh, we are now after uh, our pullback, OCT pullback, uh, after the po stent implantation and post uh, uh, dilatation. Let's move uh, to our uh, result. As we said from the beginning, we follow the MLD MAX protocol. And for this uh, second part, the acronym is MAX. M is medial dissection. A is a position and uh, X is the expansion. So I will start from the expansion. Let's see our result. As uh, you can see, as we said, we stand in the, a long segment of coronary artery 
from the proximal part to the medial distal part. And when you stand a very long segment with uh, different side branches, the way to evaluate the expansion of the stent is not to divide in two precise uh, uh, half part the stents, but the proximal half of the stent must be before the first uh, uh, bifurcation, which, we, which is in this case the first uh, uh, diagonal that uh, we, we discussed at the beginning. And the second part of the stent, uh, it will be the evaluation of the expansion mm, from the uh, part, from the coronary artery beyond the side, uh, the, the ostium of the side branch. So in this case, you can see that in the proximal part, we have, I think, a very good expansion because the automatic uh, uh, detection of the expansion by the software is uh, more than 100 percent and it's compared of course to the proximal uh, uh, proximal part where uh, we landed uh, the proximal reference and uh, if we move to the second part of the stent uh, beyond the bifurcation you can see that also here the expansion is perfect because it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's 100 so we think uh, acceptable uh, what about the other part of the algorithm, the app position, the software Ultron automatically detect, as uh, you can see, if there is a mala position of the stent. Of course, you can scroll and you can check, but the software, as I said, underline a mala position if uh, there is a yellow bar in the lumen profile view. And here you can see that uh, there is no yellow indication of uh, uh, mala pose struts. So we are happy about this, but of of course, uh, if we scroll, you can see here some uh, yellow struts, but it's not a malaposed strut, but because we are in uh, uh, proximity of a side branch, perhaps we are, we, we see with the co-registration as was, there was that uh, small uh, uh, septal, uh, septal branch. What uh, about uh, at the end the uh, medial dissection? We have to look where we landed with the stent. So we start from distal and here you can see the last struts where we landed and you can see that we have a perfect up position of the stent and we have no malapose struts and uh, we are satisfied about this. And no dissection. We, and uh, I think uh, that here is the point where which we decided to post it with the free O balloon. If we move to the proximal part, uh, and you can see again also here that we have struts well opposed to the vessel wall, and uh, if uh, we these are the last struts, and again in the transition between the landing zone and the healthy vessel, we land in a good vessel, in a good part of the vessel, because we can clearly identify here the EEL, yeah. and uh, there is no uh, medial dissection. So I think uh, Luigi. Yeah. We did uh, a good uh, uh, preparation of the lesion in this case, and uh, we have uh, a, a, good, uh, a good expansion, no dissection, a good position. Okay, perfect. I think, Luigi, that also the angiography result is... Is uh, uh, very, very good. Very good. We have a timid free flow in all the vessel, in LAD, in the second diagonal, in the first diagonal. The patient is uh, okay, yes. so I think uh, we are satisfied about our OCT-guided totally uh, uh, procedure. So uh, thanks to our nurses, to all our staff. Uh, we give again uh, uh, the ball to the uh, studio in Paris, uh, and uh, we are uh, really, uh, really anxious to, to know your comment about uh, this case. Please, Paolo, join us in the panel. Since you are anxious Thanks to hear so much our comments. Thanks so much for this nice demonstration how go. to deal with calcified lesion. I am asking about uh, bear size, uh, how to select the proper bear size for uh, each vessel. Imaging can help us, or there is default bear or something else. The two. I mean, the answer is in the middle. I mean, if you, if you are doing this kind of procedure with imaging, which is the ideal scenario, then what we target to do nowadays with the plaque modification protocol is a 0.5 bar to artery ratio. Let's say for a three millimeter vessel, you would make it with a 1.5 millimeter bar, so just as a rough indication. If you don't do this with imaging, it's a little bit more difficult. The two, rule of thumb is uh, that with 1.5, maximum 175, you do most of, the, most of the job. I mean, that's just a practical suggestion. So while I invite uh, uh, Jan to take the podium for the next uh, uh, interview, I'd like just to hear short comment from Lawrence. 
in a calcified lesion setting, what are reasonable target um, OCT result to achieve? We know that ideally we should get 100% stent expansion, circularity, uh, and so forth. But practically, what are your uh, thresholds? Well, the thresholds are uh, the same as in usual lesions. So usually we aim for at least 80% relative stent expansion. And in uh, this situation of a proximal mid-LAD, uh, minimal stent area for uh, more than 4.5 millimeters square, that would be the minimal uh, requirement. It gets a bit uh, more difficult, not addressed in this case, if you have to deal with calcific protrusions where probably a lot of unmet needs are uh, still right. uh, 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 present, but usually four, above 4.5 and 80% relative stent expansion. Thank you very much for this very practical tip. One of the issues in adopting uh, a technology, and intravascular imaging in particular, is to implement this technology within our workflow. And I guess the best way to improve that is to standardize the protocol as much as we can. And that was actually the question we posed to Jan, please. Okay, so we spoke about the standardizing things uh, today multiple times. So uh, my answer uh, after the conflict of interest is why standardized OCT workflow? I believe there is a need for a systematic approach in coronary disease imaging. And that's because there is a huge difference between OCT control, PCI, and OCT guided. Because if you do something like you perform your PCI and then you put a OCD catheter inside and you check how good you did, usually realize that you didn't do uh, good enough. You will, find, you will end up with these orange uh, parts of the, of the uh, under expansion. You will end up with these yellow bars of, uh, of malaposition. And what's a good way to go is to do a proper OCT guided PCI. It means you will start with the native uh, pre-PCI pullback and you will get as much information as you can from the from the OCT about the vessel and you can put as I said this puzzle all together uh, ideally even with the functional uh, assessment and I believe that the OCT operator have to adapt a certain mindset it means you have to plan your procedure based on the intravascular imaging you have to perform the uh, procedure based on your knowledge you got and you have to react uh, and you have to optimize your result. And in the end, you have to do your final review until you are satisfied. So basically, these steps are actually incorporated in the MLD Max protocol that we are all uh, in the last years trying to adopt in our workflows. And MLD Max is really nicely explaining, and you can nicely remember that, that you have a morphology, length, diameter, part before the PCI, and then you have this medial dissection, apposition, and expansion part during your post-PCI optimization. So the key advantage is, from my point of view of systematic approach, that I can never stress out more the key role of the pre-PCI pullback because you will get all the information you need, and you will know where is the calcium, where not to end up with the stent edges, where you should prepare the region more, where you should prepare the region in a different way than you may be suspected during your NGO, etc., etc. And I strongly believe that it's important also to standardize the sizing and the measurements across the interventional community, because that way we will do a similar and good job to our patients uh, when we are trying to uh, plan our procedures. So at the end, you, are, you can use the help of EEL uh, protocol. This protocol shows us that uh, this uh, sometimes in the Ultron software automatically calculated uh, measurements can guide us through the a sizing of the stent and the post dilatation balloon. And we know that the risk of complication comparing to simple NGO guided PCI is not significantly increased. This data we have, for example, from, uh, from Illumian 3 trial. So, what can we avoid using MLD Max protocol? So, basically, we are avoiding unsuitable region preparation strategy. We know the rule of five. We spoke about how to calculate the risk of the calcium-based complications. And if you have a calcium volume index score 4 to 5, you really need to thorough prepare your region with all you have, with all you can use until you are satisfied, as Powell today nicely showed. And you are avoiding improper stent size choice. 
because having a EL or woman and having a standardized protocol and a standardized approach to measurements, you can choose the best size and the length of the stand for your patient. And the last thing, you can avoid the stand failure risk due to missed malaposition, under expansion, or significant dissection at the end of the procedure if you go step by step as a MLD Max protocol shows you. So uh, you can see the uh, mandra expansion over here. You can see malaposition over here. It's seen even here in the cross section. And you can see a huge dissection over there. And the systematic approach will help you to find and identify these problems and deal with that before you put the patient down from the table. So the last slide, key learning, key learning points from my point of view, crucial importance of pre-PCI OCT. Simple OCT controlled PCI is not OCT guided PCI. Please remember that. Standardized workflow, MLD Max, can help you in covering all important steps during lesion diagnostics and intervention. And I strongly believe that using systematic approach supports the confidence of you as an operator when you are working with your patients. And I think it's very similar both for the new standard user and even the experts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I would like to ask uh, S Sandeep, did you have any, or do you have any good comments there? Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. So we, we've had some excellent interaction with the audience in the room and also online as well. Most of the questions have revolved around what techniques we would use to modify calcium. A lot of this session has focused on calcium modification to avoid stent failure. And I think the summary really is what we've heard from the panel and from, from uh, some people in the floor is that there are several tools available in this day and age to enable us to deliver these uh, procedures well, to help us modify and prepare the vessels. And it's not one size fits all. We just need to use whichever tools we need to to deliver an optimal procedure. There was one second um, theme that's come up, and maybe I'll just go to Nevis on this one, was when we aren't using a second stent, so when we aren't putting in a second layer of stent, which you did in your case, Nevis, what would be your recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy after this? Um, so in this case, um, we treated uh, with a drug coated balloon after expanding the stent, so we didn't implant a second stent, that would have been uh, another problem. So uh, we used uh, the usual uh, DAPT therapy we use for drug coated balloons now in our institution is three months of uh, DAPT. Um, in this case, with the, uh, I think it's different when you know there's a clear cause of the thrombosis. Like in this case, I don't think you probably need to prolong extensively the DAPT in this patient because there was a clear cause that was uh, that was corrected. So the problem was not really uh, a problem of uh, DAPT therapy, but it was a problem of the end expansion. Thank you. All right, I think we are right on time for the. Uh, key learnings. Uh, we gathered some here. I'm sure there will be many others that you have taken home with you. But in our opinion, the importance of the identification of the mechanisms of stent failure to apply the best tailor therapy is a must. I think we, we had two beautiful cases that nicely exemplified this first uh, key learning. Using intravascular imaging according to the MLD Max algorithms helps reducing the risk of stent failure. And finally, artificial intelligence enhances the capability of intravascular imaging to support accurate and fast decision making for patient treatment. With this, we would like to thank you very much to join us for this session and we wish you good continuation of the Congress. Thank you.